So today, we're going to be looking into the book of Noah. Now, the book of Noah is the fifth of the 12 minor prophets. Now, these 12 books are no less important than the so-called major prophets. It's just that the books are much shorter than prophets such as Isaiah or Jeremiah. Jonah is only four chapters long compared to Isaiah, which is 66 chapters long, and Jeremiah, which is 52 chapters. Now, as an interesting side note regarding this book, it is read annually during the Jewish High Holy Day of Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. It is read to instill reflection on God's willingness to forgive, as we will see. And it just so happens that Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, begins today at sundown. And I didn't know that when I chose this book. Our Jewish friends seek God's forgiveness each year on this day by abstaining from eating, drinking, and bathing, along with marital relations. As Christians, we seek God's forgiveness when we sin, knowing that Jesus has already paid the price, the penalty, for all of a believer's sins, past, present, and future. For we know, quote, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth we confess resulting in salvation. As we are singing uh, that last song, there was a the very, one of the last verses it says, my king has crushed the curse of death. I am his forever. And those of us who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, at one point in time, realized that we were sinners. We may have been comparing ourselves to our neighbors, to the people we see on the nightly news, and said, hey, I'm not so bad. But 32 years ago, if you saw me, I recognize that I was wicked and evil, just like these Ninevites we're going to read about. And none of us, none of us compares to God Almighty. And his forgiveness is available to everyone. And that, you know, we are, without him, we are condemned. That's a harsh thing to say, I know. But with him, we have eternal life, and he has crushed the curse of death. So keep that in mind, folks. This little but important book is unique in that it is not a record of Jonah's prophecy. It is a personal narrative. It does not contain any predictions but it does provide us with a number of important issues or important lessons. And even though only four chapters long, as we will see, Jonah has much to teach us. Now, before any skeptics write this off as just a children's story or believe that it is fiction, here's a couple of facts to lend credence to this book of the Bible. First, can a person live inside a whale or a great fish for three days? Mm hmm Yes. In February of 1891, it's been reported that James Bartley went overboard from a whaling ship and was swallowed by a whale. A few days later, the whale was caught, and when the sailors started cutting up the whale, they found Bartley inside, unconscious, but alive. And then and there are other examples, such as Michael Packard, a lobster diver who two years ago off Cape Cod was swallowed by a humpback whale. He was spit out, but it appears that it is possible. Then we have Jesus using the examples of Jonah when being confronted by the Pharisees, wanting a miracle. Part of, of Jesus' reply is recorded in Matthew 12, 40. Quote, For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Jesus compares his death, burial, and resurrection to Jonah's time in the great fish. And in Matthew 16, Jesus again uses Jonah's example. Quote, an evil and adulterous generation wants a sign, and so a sign will not be given it except the sign of Joseph. And he left them and went away. And in Luke 11:32, we hear Jesus say, quote, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it 
because they repented at the preaching of Joseph, Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So it is clear that Jesus believed that Jonah's story was legit. And Jonah is referenced in uh, 2 Kings 11 as bringing the word of the Lord to King Jeroboam II of Israel. Quote, he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Geth Hepper. So Jonah is a real character from history as recorded in the Old Testament and by Jesus' own words. And think of this. As Christians, we affirm and believe that Jesus rose from the dead after three days in the grave. We affirm and believe that Jesus worked miracles like raising people from the dead, healing lepers, and demon-possessed people. What makes it so hard to believe that God was able to do the things he did with Jonah? God was able to raise Jesus from the dead after three days. He can keep a man alive inside a great fish for three days too. Now to what is recorded about Jonah. The book of Jonah can be found on pages 657 and 658 in the Pew Bibles. I'm not going to read the whole book of Jonah to you, but I'm just going to run through the high points. You can read this for yourself in a short time. It's only 48 verses long. Here's the basic outline of the book. Jonah is, Jonah is commanded by God to go to Nineveh, which God labels as wicked. Nineveh was possibly the largest city in the world at that time, uh, with over 120,000 people living there. But Jonah decides to flee from the presence of the Lord. Jonah goes to the coast, buys passage on a ship heading as far away from Nineveh as he can get. But God hurls a great wind against the sea, and the boat begins to sink. The sailors are terrified and begin to toss the cargo overboard. They pray to their gods. They pray to their gods. They pray hoping one of their household gods knows the God who knows a God who controls the wind and the sea. The captain finds Jonah asleep in the bottom of ship, the ship and says, how is it that you are sleeping? The captain then tells Jonah to pray to his God. Meanwhile, the superstitious sailors want to know who has caused the gods to be so upset. They cast lots to find out who God is mad at, and the lot falls to Jonah. They ask Jonah questions to which he replies, quote, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This makes the sailors extremely afraid because Jonah has told them he was running away from this God. Jonah then tells the sailors, quote, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you. Now, Jonah really didn't want to go to Nineveh. The sailors now pray to the Lord. Yes, these pagan sailors pray to Yahweh. Quote, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. And do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. They then pick up Jonah, toss him into the sea, and the waves and the wind stop. The sailors offer sacrifice to the Lord and make vows. And just then, God appoints a great fish to swallow Jonah. Inside the great fish, or whale, Jonah prays and repents and ends his prayer saying, Salvation is from the Lord. After three days in the, in the whale, the whale vomits Joseph up on the beach. Yuck. Once again, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to them. And he goes and says what God told him to say. Quote, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Amazingly, the people begin to repent. Even the king issues an edict that all people and animals were to put on sackcloth and ashes. Not only that were they to turn away from their evil ways, which they did, and God relented. That makes Jonah very angry. Makes him angry. Can you believe it? Now, let's remember the Ninevites were Israel's enemy, and they were savage. So saving them wouldn't have gone over well back home. In chapter 4, we finally see why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. For as he is praying, he says, quote, 
For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to be saved. He was angry. After all, they were Israel's bitter enemy. And God asked Jonah, quote, Do you have good reason to be angry? Jonah then leaves the city and goes to a hill and watches what will happen next. It's so hot that God appoints a plant to grow up and provide Jonah some shade. That makes him extremely happy. The next night, God appoints a worm to come and kill the plant. And then God appoints a scorching east wind to beat down on Jonah. And that makes Jonah so angry, he wants to die. God then says to Jonah, quote, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, that great city where there, in which there are 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? The end. Yes, that's how the book of Jonah ends, with a question. Now what do we learn from this strange but true book of the Bible? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Yes, it is about forgiveness, there's no doubt. But we'll, I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. First, let's start with the big picture. What do we call it when God controls the wind and the sea, the actions of sailors who don't believe in him, a great fish, the repentance of a pagan city, a plant to grow and a worm to eat it? What do we call these actions of God? We call it sovereignty. God is sovereign. God is the dominant power, the supreme authority over everything and everyone. As it says in Colossians 1, 16 and 17, quote, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Don't miss this. All things were created through him and for him. The God we worship is in charge of all these things and so much more. We see God creating the universe in Genesis. Not only just this little planet with its animals and plants and insects, but a universe that is incomprehensible. He not only created the oceans, but he controls the winds and the waves. We see Jesus controlling the wind and the waves in the Sea of Galilee. We worship a God who meets a widow from the town of Nain whose only son has died and is being carried out for burial. Jesus stops them and says, young man, arise. The young man comes to life, sits up, and begins to speak. He speaks to the parents of a young girl who has died, telling them their daughter is only asleep. They laugh at him. He takes the girl's hand and she comes to life. He famously does this with the only brother of two sisters when he brings Lazarus to life after four days in the grave. We call this sovereignty. No other power in the universe has the ability to do these things. Now, many of you can look back over your life and see how God arranged events to have you in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. Maybe it was to be in the right place to help somebody or God arranged for you to be in just the right place at the right time when he changed your heart and you said yes to the gospel. God in his sovereignty arranges situations to test our faith. It wasn't just Isaac who God tested when he said sacrifice your son and then provided a lamb when, Jesus, when Isaac was about to comply. We see God's sovereignty in our everyday life. We see his actions displayed throughout the Bible. Quote, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, end quote. Romans 8.28 does, just doesn't tell us that God is in control. It tells us he is working in his sovereign ways 
to work for our good in all things. In all things, people. And think about Jonah and the calamity that befell him. A massive storm being thrown overboard, swallowed by a whale. And yet God used this recalcitrant prophet to save 120,000 unbelievers from his wrath. God did work all those things for good according to his purpose. He does this in the lives of his children too. So don't be surprised when God uses calamity in your life to benefit others or to redirect your actions. As has been said, there's not a molecule in the universe that God doesn't control. And think about what is written in Acts 4, 27 and 28, where we read, quote, For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection were planned and predestined by God in his sovereignty. God in his sovereignty told Jonah to go to a wicked city. When Jonah tried to disobey, he hurled a massive storm against the ship. When the sailors finally tossed Jonah overboard, God appointed a great fish to swallow him and get him back to shore. God had appointed the wicked Ninevites would repent and he would relent because he is a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents from calamity. In all this, God demonstrated his sovereign control over the elements of nature and man. Now, think back over your own life. Has God sent storms into your life? Times when you were afraid of perishing and out of nowhere the answer came? Maybe it wasn't as dramatic as being thrown into the sea to be swallowed by a great fish. It could have been something as every day as being terminated from your job, only to have something better being provided. When the storms of life come, don't be like Jonah was at first, turning your back on the Lord. Be like Jonah was in the great fish. Pray, seek the Lord and his salvation. For God is in control. Now, a second lesson. Jonah's story reminds us of who God is and how he acts. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. He is one who relents concerning calamity. This quote first appears in Exodus 34, 6, when God passes by Moses and speaks to him out of the cloud. Moses had broken the tablets of stone when he saw the pagan acts of his people. God instructed Moses to rewrite the tablets and then quote, then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and truth, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing. It's repeated in Numbers 14, 18, when Moses pleads with God not to wipe out the Israelites in the desert. And we find it again in Psalm 86, verses 5 and 15, quote, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. And, but you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in mercy and truth. Like Jonah, David in the Psalm pleads with God. Quote, Turn to me and be gracious to me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. We find this idea in Joel 2, and Israel is warned of a coming disaster at the hands of their enemies. Quote, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your heart, not merely your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in mercy, and relenting of catastrophe. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Or how about Daniel and his friends in the fiery furnace? Or Saul, who was breathing out death and calamity upon those who converted from Judaism to Christianity? God knocked him down, made him temporarily blind, and he became one of those who were converted. Or even more recently, Johnny Erickson Tata, who at 17 broke her neck in a diving accident and became a quadriplegic. She's now 73 years old 
and has an international Christian ministry to the disabled, which she has led for decades. I even know of a Christian woman who had stage four cancer. Her doctor told her that women with this diagnosis lived on average 18 months. They lived on an average of 18 months. And now, some 20 years later, she's still ministering to hurting women. Over and over, we are reminded of who God is and how he acts. Yet, the greatest demonstration of God's graciousness and compassion, of being slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and relenting from calamity, is ascending Jesus to take the place of sinners like you and me. Jesus took the wrath of God on the cross in our place, and he has granted forgiveness to you and me and to new life to millions. You can possibly look back at your life as I can and see that you were a Ninevite, evil and wicked, and God caused you to repent and to be reborn again. He had every reason to take out his wrath on you and me, but he chose to be gracious and compassionate full of abundant loving kindness. He saved you and me and gave us a new life, even when we did nothing to deserve it. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. Dead men and women don't reach out to God. As we saw with the many examples of Jesus raising people from the dead, it is his grace that takes us from a state of spiritual deadness and makes us alive. It is not only by his grace that he changes our hearts to be able to see him and desire him. That's two things we learn or are reminded of by Jonah's story. The sovereignty of God and his abundant loving kindness. Do you remember how the book ended in chapter 4? God asks a question of Jonah and us. Quote, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and left, as well as many animals? What a strange way to end a book of the Bible. God wasn't just asking that question of Jonah. It is asked of every person who reads or hears the ending of this book. The Lord is asking us to think about our own life, to think about our own life and how we are living it. Are we so focused on our self-interest that we look past the greater things of God? Jonah was so happy when, the, when the God appointed a plant to grow and provide him shade. And then he was angry when it was attacked and withered by a worm that God had appointed. He was happy about a plant that gave him shade, but could care less about 120,000 pagans who repented. Jonah was upset that Israel's enemy was saved. He was probably concerned about how this would go over back at home. He and the leaders of Israel would much rather God wipe out those wicked Ninevites than save them. God is telling us that his love for the lost is much greater than our own self-interest. We see this played out during Jesus' time on earth in Matthew, Matthew 23, where we find Jesus saying, quote, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weighter provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are things you should have done without neglecting the others. End quote. The Jewish leaders of the time were more interested in showing off by tithing their herbs than they were in being obedient to the big things of God. What is it God wants you to do? What is it that God wants you to do? Are you focused on your own self-interest and letting God's agenda go by the wayside? I will let God speak to your hearts about how this might apply to you individually rather than try and come up with, with uh, possible scenarios. Now, as a side note, the repentance of the Ninevites didn't last long. The book of the prophet Nahum tells us what happens to Nineveh about 100 years later. The prophecy of Nahum came true when the Babylonians came and wiped out the city of Nineveh, never, never to be rebuilt. The repentance and turning to God took place as a result of Jonah's preaching had vanished. In a few short generations, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those who were saved had forgotten what God had done. 
The lessons learned at the preaching of Jonah were not passed down to future generations. They reverted to their old evil ways. Their evil is cataloged by historians. And believe me, if you study the book of Nahum, you'll see that the Ninevites of his day were wicked beyond belief. Even though Jonah preached repentance and the whole city of Nineveh repented, he didn't stick around and instruct the people. He went out of the city and sulked. In a few short generations, Nineveh reverted to its old ways of conquest and torture. God was not pleased and destroyed the city. So there's a lesson to be learned even here. Are we teaching our children and grandchildren about who this God is who saved us? Are we calling on them to repent of their wicked ways and walk with Christ? This is certainly a concern of Harvest Bible Church. Hundreds of hours are spent by youth leaders in preparing junior church lessons and youth group lessons. Yet how are those lessons reinforced by the children's parents and grandparents in how they live their lives? We hear God say in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, quote, Hear, Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and daughters, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. These are not just instructions or commands to the Israelites. They are words to live by as parents and grandparents today. The Ninevites did not have pastors and teachers to instruct them in the Lord as we do. So there's four lessons to be learned. One, God is sovereign over everything. Two, he is gracious and loving. Three, he wants us to look beyond our self-interest to his interest. And four, he wants us to keep teaching our children and grandchildren about who he is. There are many other lessons to be learned. I would suggest you take some time and read this little book for yourselves. Read it through a number of times, asking God to illumine your mind as you read it. Now here's one more lesson to consider. All of chapter 2 is focused on Jonah's prayer. Jonah prays in verse 2, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. That alone tells us about our God and how he acts. Jonah prays, I cried for help from the depths of Sheol. You heard my voice. Even though Jonah rebelled against God's commands, God still listened to his prayer. He will listen to yours. When we are in deep trouble, even trouble of our own making, we can and should cry out to the Lord. As his children, he hears us. Jonah had been thrown overboard because of his rebellion was the cause of the storm. We, like Jonah, can cry out too and seek the Lord's help when we are in the belly of a great fish. Now, it's unlikely that you will be swallowed by whole by a whale. But you and I may find ourselves in financial troubles, battling mental or bodily health challenges, or being persecuted for our faith. Even if those troubles are caused by some actions of your own making, cry out to the Lord. Think about David. Many of his troubles were of his own making. In Psalm 18, verse 6, David prays fervently, quote, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. God wants and expects his children to go to him when we have troubles, big or small. Over and over, Jesus tells his disciples to ask for anything in his name, and the Father will grant it. Think about Jonah's situation. He prays, quote, The water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. He was drowning. Seaweed was wrapped around him. Even as he was at death's door, he prays, quote, While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Just as a side note, when you are praying, where do you place your faith? Jesus warns us, quote, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Jonah ends his prayer saying, salvation is from the Lord. That is so true. 
Salvation from our troubles is from the Lord. He is sovereign over everything, even our troubles. More importantly, salvation is from the penalty of our sinful life. That is from the Lord. Don't wait until you're at death's door, drowning in your own sin, to cry out to Jesus to save you. Right now, if you hear God calling you, repent for a life of disobedience. Do so now. It may be a call on your life to repent for your sinful life for the first time. Or it may be that he's calling on you, Christian, to repent of some sinfulness you are involved in now. In either case, salvation is from the Lord. Call on him. Go to him. God gives us the book of Jonah to learn from it. Not just be entertained by an interesting story. He wants us to see his sovereignty in all of life in calamity and blessing. He wants you to know who he is, gracious and compassionate, full of loving kindness. He wants us to consider how we view our own self-interest versus the greater things he has commanded us to do. He wants us to be examples to our children and others while teaching them about who he is. He wants us to pray for our day-to-day needs when faced with calamity. That's five lessons. As you read and reread this book, I'm sure you'll uncover more. We have seen from the book of Jonah that God is marvelously wonderful and great. He lets us go about our life before coming to know him, even if that means we lead a life of wickedness and sin. But when God opens our eyes and hearts to know who he is and how magnificent he is, an eternal light shines into our life. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, quote, And even if our gospel is is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants on account of Jesus. For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ. When God shines that light into your heart and mind, you cannot say no to him. As the knowledge of who Jesus is and what he has done for humankind penetrates into your heart, you will and are changed. God showed great mercy to the pagan Ninevites and sailors and to disobedient Jonah. He has shown great mercy to those whom he has redeemed, who he has saved and is saving. I pray that all who hear this message will not harden their hearts and turn away from God as Jonah did at first. You may not be given another opportunity. I ask the Lord God that any blindness that the God of this world has caused to fall on unbelievers be removed by the light of Christ's gospel. Salvation is from the Lord. If the light of the good news that is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has pierced the darkness of your sinful heart, repent and confess. Repent and confess. Run to the loving, compassionate, gracious arms of God. For he is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, He makes us alive together with Christ. For it is by grace that we are being saved. It is my prayer today that our unsaved family members and neighbors would come to know the light that is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that anyone listening would not run away from God when he calls. Let us pray. Father, I ask that you open the eyes and the hearts of the lost to the beautiful light that is the knowledge and love of you. Please save the lost, Lord, especially our family members. Bring them into your love and make them part of your family. I ask you, Lord, to emblazon the lessons of Jonah upon the minds and the hearts of those who hear this message. Help each of us to grasp your your sovereignty over all things, to see that you are in all the details of life, that we would come to know and to know more fully your grace, compassionate, and abundant loving kindness so that the knowledge of you would change us 
Change us to be more like Jesus. Help each one here to see the greater things you would have them do and teach and train the children. Help us to pray and turn to you in all our day-to-day living, as well as when calamity strikes. Father, we ask all this in the name of our most magnificent Savior, Jesus Lord. Amen.